Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. In this installment, I'll be talking about a film on Netflix called Velvet Buzzsaw. Now, if you haven't seen the film, I'm going to go ahead and recommend that you watch it before going any further with this video. It's a fun movie. Go watch it. Okay, now, just to be upfront, I do think this film is a little uneven. It lacks focus. Though, of course, I am aware of the irony of criticizing a film that, in some respects, takes aim at critics. But nonetheless, I gotta say this movie is all over the place. In fairness, it does seem as though Velvet Buzzsaw is thematically ambitious, and I think there is something worth talking about here. So I don't quite have a fully baked analysis for you this time around, but I do have a few stray observations about the film that I want to share. Simply put, this is a film about the nature of art, those who make art, and those who profit from it. There is some kind of supernatural force at play in the film that carries out violence against those who attempt to profit from an unknown artist's work. It kind of gives the whole idea of a work of art as an autonomous object a whole new meaning, doesn't it? I have heard this film described as an elaborate sort of fantasy wish fulfillment for artists, and I think that's an apt characterization. Though it's worth pondering the sort of contradictions at the heart of such a fantasy. Now, we might speculate that there's a vengeful spirit at the heart of this violent activity throughout the film. Perhaps the specter of Ventral Dees, the deceased artist whose work is routinely stolen and appropriated. Though we the viewers have no direct confirmation of that, but it is clear that Dees did not want his work to be sold. In fact, he was in the process of burning all of his paintings prior to his death. Over the course of the film, those who steal his artwork and attempt to profit from it are subject to horrific attacks leading to their death. So we have this troubled artist figure, Ventral Dees. As a character, Dees is a void. In other words, he is characterized mainly through negation, what he is not. He's not alive, he's not an active presence in this art scene, and perhaps more importantly, we have every indication that he didn't want to be. I'd argue that Dees is not a character per se, but rather an elaborate sort of plot device. The formal scaffolding of this character, the biographical details that are unceremoniously doled out, indicate simply that he was an artist with severe psychological issues, the mad artist. But simply, Dees is a trope. This trope is employed to give his art a chilling aura that, in turn, works to highlight a certain recurring dynamic. It's a dynamic that actually has nothing to do with Dees. Namely, what I'm referring to here is the internal tension of each of these respective characters, both in their relations to others, as well as their relation to art itself. It's clear that these characters are haunted by their own respective demons. In this regard, Velvet Buzzsaw is a very individualistic kind of film. There's a sense in which this scattershot cast of pretenders and manipulators are, each of them, totally engrossed in their own various neuroses. Their interactions with Dees' art and the specific manner in which each character meets their untimely demise are thematically linked to the notion that they have succumbed to these neuroses, and in doing so, they have failed to live up to some artistic ideal. The foremost character that comes to mind here is this gallery owner named Redora Hayes, played by Rene Russo. I think it's fair to say that Hayes operates in a cynical fashion, navigating the art scene in a manner akin to a very calculating sort of merchant, someone who, first and foremost, prizes both money and social capital, even perhaps at the cost of some lofty ideal such as artistic integrity. Hayes is a former member of a punk band, the titular Velvet Buzzsaw, though one gets the sense that she has long since abandoned any kind of punk sensibility. In other words, you might say she's sold out. She's turned her back on her previous ideals. I would say the buzzsaw is very clearly a symbol of this betrayal. And so it only makes sense that the velvet buzzsaw tattoo on Hayes's neck is, in fact, what ends up killing her. As the film progresses, the capitalistic machinations of this highfalutin art scene are gradually laid bare. For instance, we see those lower in the hierarchy are routinely abused. We also see that a number of movers and shakers in this world care little about the actual works of art. It's also very telling who does and who doesn't get killed in this film. There is a very obvious thematic dichotomy here, that being money versus art. 
More specifically, the film depicts the manner in which the drive for profit corrupts individuals and in turn comes at odds with some higher abstract moral principle. In this case, we can perhaps say it's the value of art for its own sake. And since this is a sort of fantasy for the quintessential artist, those who allow this incentive to corrupt the artistic process are subject to both judgment and punishment, ultimately death. While there is a kind of base-level catharsis that one experiences watching all of these pretentious assholes get what's coming to them, I do think this is an incredibly facile dichotomy. What occurs on screen is a very childish kind of wish fulfillment. On the other hand, the film seems aware of its own childishness. It doesn't take itself too seriously, and there is something admirable about that. The contradictory nature of this fantasy is perhaps best evidenced by the character arc of this art critic, the comically named Morph Vandewalt, played by Jake Gyllenhaal. As best I can gather, Morph is a devout aestheticist when it comes to his approach to art criticism. He concerns himself largely with matters of aesthetics. I mean, Morph goes so far as to criticize the appearance of the casket at a funeral he attends. He's a real piece of work, this guy. And of course, Morph is a bit of a caricature, a comically exaggerated version of an art critic. Though, interestingly, he's the first to really comprehend the horrific nature of this dead man's work. Earlier in the film, Morph finds himself in a position where art criticism no longer seems to be a fulfilling process. At various points, you get the sense that he feels ambivalent about certain negative reviews that he wrote. And since he finds Deese to be such a mysterious figure, he sets out to write a book about him. It's at this point in the film that he comes to learn some troubling details about the artist's life. He situates himself outside the mode of formal criticism, strictly speaking, and operates from the position of a biographer, someone concerned with context outside of the work itself. It is only through this biographical context that Morph comes to understand and even respect the artist's wishes. This allows him to make the critical connections necessary to comprehend what exactly is happening. That is, everyone who attempts to capitalize on this art is being systematically targeted by some kind of horrific force. Of course, Morph realizes this a bit too late, and ironically, the once incisive critic is murdered by an art installation, the so-called Hobo Man, a piece he briefly criticizes earlier in the film. I somewhat cheekily titled this essay Velvet Buzzsaw, Aura of the Artist, but I could have just as well called it Death of the Critic though of course that would be a bit of a spoiler. To be sure, Hobo Man is a feat of animatronics. Though in artistic terms, the piece is a facile, ham-fisted sort of commentary on the death of the American dream. I mean, (laughs) I appreciate the sentiment, but the execution is a bit too on the nose for my tastes. Hopefully it doesn't come after me for saying that. Now, one of the more enigmatic characters in the film is a famous artist named Pierce, played by John Malkovich. Despite being wildly successful, Pierce is in a bit of a creative rut towards the beginning of this film. Oddly enough, he's one of only a few characters that doesn't get brutally murdered. The character arcs of Morph and Pierce have, in a certain sense, a peculiar kind of inverse relationship, specifically with respect to how they understand and interact with art. I find it interesting that the final scene of the movie depicts Pierce creating some elaborate series of doodles along the shoreline. Naturally, these doodles will be washed away at some point. As is suggested to him earlier in the film, Pierce is creating something just for himself. Art for art's sake. The viewer might well construe this scene as something of an artistic renaissance for Pierce, and in that respect, I can see how it would be perceived as a sound resolution for both the character and the film. But, you know, at best, I would say this is an ambiguous resolution to the arc of his character. A short reprieve, perhaps. There is a dark potentiality that lingers as the credits roll. A sense in which art itself has become the vengeful subject of social upheaval. The precise character of this upheaval remains ambiguous. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. If you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash Nightmare Masterclass. Any donation, large or small, would be highly appreciated. Thank you for watching, and good night.